One, not two. One. How many here are, are not part of this regular Wednesday gathering? Gee, okay. Huh? Well, the group that meets every Wednesday is consecutively going through Bhagavad Gita and this evening we'll be concluding chapter 3 of Bhagavad Gita and this concluding section uh, is, is in response to a question that Arjuna asks uh, by what is one impelled to do things even it seems against your own will that we do. Well, going back, Krishna's, um, the, the chapter is Karma Yoga, so he's describing the principle of um, rendering the fruits of your work to Krishna. And those that follow this faithfully, they're free from bondage. Those that don't, out of envy, they're befooled, bereft of knowledge, ruined in their endeavors for perfection. And then Krishna describes, we each have our nature, so better to act according to your nature and perform your duties according to your nature, even if you think you can do somebody else's duty better than they're doing it, better you do your own duty according to your nature. Don't come under the influence of attraction and aversion. Simply, you have your nature and engage in your duties according to your nature and offer the results up to Krishna. Then Arjuna's question is, O oh, descendant of Vishni, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force. So that's text 36. And the answer is contact with the mode of passion, there's lust. And then when lust is frustrated, then there's anger. And this this is the all devouring sinful enemy of the world. So what, what impels one into wrong action. <coughs> In Haridas Thakur's <coughs> description to Lord Chaitanya in Harinam Chintamani, you've heard of that book? Yes. Harinam Chintamani, have you read it? Lord Chaitanya is asking questions, Haridas Thakur is giving answers. Pretty interesting. Similar to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is asking Ramananda Roy questions, Ramananda Roy is giving answers. Both Ramananda Roy and Haridas say, I'm like a puppet, you're making me dance and speak, however you like, I'll speak, I'll dance. So, uh, in that... Harinam Chintamani, Haridas Thakur says there are three. It's a little, a little difference in contrast to what's being spoken here in chapter 3, Bhagavad Gita. By what is one um, blocked from the pure chanting of the holy name? And the answer is Anartas. And Anartas arise from three sources, according to Haridas Thakur. Um, thirst for the impermanent, or att 
attachment to the temporary, a sat trishna, um, where uh, yeah, hridaya dorbalyam is the second one. That is, you know better, but you do the wrong thing anyway. And the the third one is aparad. So, impurities of heart that block the pure chanting of the holy name. These are there's these three sources. And similarly, there's this language, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's language, describing the same thing elsewhere. There's the mist of ignorance and the clouds of an artist. I was thinking about that on the way over here. So, drizzling outside and cloudy sky. It was cloudy even when arriving in New York. Big clouds up upstairs and you know mist all over the place so that blocks the sun the sun is there the sun doesn't shine less when it's misty or cloudy but this the rays of the sun and the heat of the sun are blocked and there are these two it's metaphor but the mist of ignorance and the clouds of anartas so anartas are in a separate category, according to our acharyas. Anartas are in a separate category than sin. And sin, this is Jiva Goswami, Jiva Goswami teaches that sin can be neutralized up to the root um, by bhakti. You engage in bhakti and it destroys sin and the, the reaction of sin and even to the root, the tendency for sin. However, anartas are more pernicious or more difficult to address because anartas have the power to block the power of bhakti. Long description in Bhakti Sandharva. But so here, this is this lust results in sin, the all-devouring sinful enemy of the world. <laughs> and uh, lust has its sitting places. So it, it, it blocks, it does two things. It's the all-devouring sinful enemy of the world. Previous verses. <clears throat> As fire is covered by smoke, there's three stages of this lust. As a mirror is covered by dust, or as an embryo is covered by the womb, the living entity is similarly covered by different degrees of this lust. So it goes lesser, medium, and then greater. Thus, the wise living entity's pure consciousness becomes covered. By his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and burns like fire. Lust isn't, you know, there's, there's the explicit um, sexual attraction that's there in all living entities, but lust is far more broad, the application of it. It's just contact with passion, wanting to be the enjoyer of dull matter. Lust. Passion, from passion, contact with the mode of passion, comma, lust arises and from frustrated lust, anger arises. The senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the sitting places of this lust. Through them, lust covers two things. Covers the real knowledge of the living entity and bewilders him. Sometimes, not here in the Bhagavad Gita, but in Chaitanya Charitamrita and elsewhere. There are these two potencies of the external energy, the covering potency and the throwing potency. Avranatmika Shakti and Prapekshatmika Shakti, you've heard of those terms. So when the living entity turns away from Krishna, that's this passion or I want to enjoy independently of Krishna. So then 
With that, Maya covers the living entity in these two ways. He throws the living entity into the pool of forgetfulness and keeps the living entity there. The covering, the throwing and the covering potency. So even one may go beyond, let's, let's say, us or a pious person. Someone that says, I really should live my life in relation to God and I'm a spirit soul and, you know, there's the theoretical agreement. I'm, my, I'm, I'm, will, I'm, will, I'm willing to turn my attention to God, but still lust is there or the desire to be an independent enjoyer. So we're held by that, under the spell of Maya, even we're trying to become devotees because of this tendency to be an independent enjoyer. That's the, the contact with passion is still there. So bhakti is meant to take one above and beyond that influence of the, of the lower modes, from diminish the influence of passion ignorance, increase the tendency for goodness, and enter into transcendence. So knowledge that the hearing, at least even theoretically accepting, helps one in the in the matter of detachment, detachment specifically from the mis the illusion of of lusting for something. And again, it's not just male female attraction or that kind of sensual, gross sensual attraction. It's the the, the pervasive spirit of trying to be the enjoyer of matter, mode of passion. And that takes us up to these concluding three verses, 41, 42, 43. Therefore, O Arjuna, best of the Bharatas, in the very beginning, curb this great symbol of sin brackets, lust, by regulating the senses and slay this destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. Um, I'll read Prabhupada's purport. The Lord advised Arjuna to regulate the senses from the very beginning so that he could curb the greatest sinful enemy lust, which destroys the urge for self-realization and specific knowledge of the self. Jnana refers to knowledge of the self as distinguished from the non-self, or in other words, knowledge that the spirit soul is not the body. Vigyana refers to a specific knowledge of the spirit soul's constitutional position and its relationship with the Supreme Soul. It is explained thus in the Bhagavatam 2.9.31. Jnanam paramaguyam me yadvigyana samanvitam sarahasyam tat angam cha grana gaditam maya <clears throat> the knowledge of the self. Note, this is one of the Chatra Sloki verses of the Bhagavatam. The knowledge of the self and the Supreme Self is very confidential and mysterious. But such knowledge and specific realization can be understood if explained with their various aspects by the Lord Himself. Bhagavad Gita gives us that general and specific knowledge of the self. The living entities are parts and parcels of the Lord and therefore they are simply meant to serve the Lord. This consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. So, from the very beginning of life, one has to learn this Krishna consciousness and thereby one may become fully Krishna conscious and act accordingly. Paragraph. 
Lust is the only, excuse me, lust is only the perverted reflection of the love of God, which is natural for every living entity. But if one is educated in Krishna consciousness from the very beginning, that natural love of God cannot deteriorate into lust. When love of God deteriorates into lust, it is very difficult to return to the normal condition. Nonetheless, Krishna consciousness is so powerful that even a late beginner can become a lover of God by following the regular principles of devotional service. So, from any stage of life or from the time of understanding its urgency, one can begin regulating the senses in Krishna consciousness, devotional service of the Lord, and turn the lust into love of Godhead, the highest professional stage of human life. I hope you caught the, that little subtle distinction because uh, the verse says, from the very beginning. Therefore, Arjuna, o best of the Bharatas, in the very beginning. Adao, in the very beginning. So, some of us, some of you in the room are very fortunate in that uh, you, from childhood, some even from their beginning of birth, have taken birth in a devotee family and that's the beginning. In the beginning. Or, I just was today hearing Srila Prabhupada speak on this verse, Komara Acharat Pragyo Dharman Bhagavataniha Dorlabha Manusham Janma This is the beginning verse of Prahlad to his friends, classmates, Komara, Acharat, Pragyo, from the tender age of childhood is Prabhupada's translation, from the tender age of childhood. So it means the Kumara age is when kids go to school, you're five years old, you go to school. Even in his time, now it's in our time, it's five years old, you go to school. So. When it's time to go to school, it's also time to learn Bhagavad Dharma in the very beginning. So, while still within the womb, when you're five years old, or if Prabhupada's saying, if you're a late starter, most many of us late starters, well, you know, to, to, to have this really clear understanding of Bhagavad Gita, that is to say, the having the opportunity to hear Bhagavad Gita from disciplic succession. I'm sure there's persons in this room, like others that I've met, that uh, from childhood they've read Bhagavad Gita as it isn't, and became very uh, surprised that they couldn't understand Bhagavad Gita as it isn't, or say it ver conversely, that, that they did not until they came in contact with Bhagavad Gita as it is, could they understand Bhagavad Gita and feel the effects of Bhagavad Gita, namely, just a little sharing, somebody in the Midwest uh, at a Bhakti Riksha gathering and they did the beginning part, the icebreaker, any realizations you, you had this week you'd like to share? This one fellow, very enthusiastic. Um, since I've been a young boy, I've always been attracted to Bhagavad Gita. Whenever there was some opportunity to study Bhagavad Gita, I would participate. And then I went to college and kind of got lost in the abyss of academic studies. But when I finished my studies, I then started looking. So whenever there was opportunity, I took Bhagavad Gita classes, Bhagavad Gita study groups. And I, I, honestly speaking, I never really understood Bhagavad Gita, although I had faith in it. And then I moved to this area, and I heard there's a Bhakti Riksha, the Bhakti Riksha group, you study Bhagavad Gita, so I came. And I, you know, for the first time, I'm understanding Bhagavad Gita. And I wanted to share that, and, and I have this anger problem. It's right on the topic, because from lust comes anger. I have this anger problem, not, you know, like rage or anything like that, 
but I've taken anger management courses and I've, I've done different things, but especially at work when we have a task to do and it gets down to production time and everyone's blaming the other guy and mm -hmm. instead of getting the work done. You know, and it, like, it makes me angry. But I've only been attending Bhakti Vriksha, I've studied Bhagavad Gita for a few months, two and a half months, and I didn't like take a course to try to overcome anger, but it just, anger has subsided. And uh, it, it happened, it's been happening, it's, you know, there's the deadline and everyone's doing the blaming each other thing. And I didn't get angry, I just stayed focused and got the work done that we needed to get done. And I was, I looked inside and said, there's only one answer, how this is possible. It's the association of the devotees and this, the careful study of Bhagavad Gita. It's helping me to overcome, you know, the, taking a step further, overcome lust, which is contact with the mode of passion that later transforms into wrath or anger. Just hearing the message of Bhagavad Gita in a, in a, in a proper forum from proper sources from the simplex succession, and there's an effect. At least for that man, maybe for some of the rest of us also. The, the, the qualities of goodness are in, enhanced and the influences of the modes of passion and ignorance are diminished because those, particularly the mode of passion and its corollary of, passion, of, of lust, it covers real knowledge of the self. I am the Driyam of any Vesha Tashat. He said, Apetasha Viparya Yo Smritihi. We forget who we really are. When it, it's like, you know, the cloud cover. The cloud cover is very strong and the mist is very, very thick. You can't see the sun. You can't see yourself when this I want to enjoy spirit is sufficiently strong. And, and knowledge helps knowledge helps in the realm of detachment. This is what Prabhupada is explaining in this <coughs> lecture about Prahlad. Knowledge, exactly as it's saying here in the purport, knowledge means, jnana means, knowledge of the self, knowledge of who we are. And vairagya, jnana vairagya, they flow naturally from bhakti, Sarva Bhumabhadacharya in his 100 verses glorifying Lord Chaitanya. Vairagya vidya nija bhakti yoga shikshartam ekam purushak paranam. Same. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to teach the process of bhakti, which within, within bhakti itself is jnana, this, that is knowledge of who we are. Then Prabhupada is making this distinction big jnana. We're spirit, and we're part of the Supreme Spirit. We're meant for His service. Gana vigana mastikim. Bhakti is we just act in that relationship with the Supreme, and the effect, when done properly, when done properly, when the senses are regulated by the regulations of bhakti, it diminishes the influence of lust or because we're using the senses instead for service to Krishna. Now there certainly can be a mix, generally there is a mix of I'm doing something because I like it and I don't do something because I don't like it. And I find happiness doing the things I like. You know, some people like washing pots. Some people don't like washing pots. But some people wash pots whether they like washing pots or not. And that, that when we do things because it's for the pleasure of Krishna, that's the higher taste. There's, a, there's that's love. And love, love, bhakti is that power that dissolves the modes of nature and the influence of the modes of nature upon us, lust and anger. Text 41. Whoops, we did. Text 
takes 42. Ah. Indriyani Paranyahur, who in the room knows that verse? Well known verse. I see one hand. Do you know the verse? No? No. You know the verse? Yeah. Go ahead. Indriyani Paranyahur, Indriyapya Paramana, Manasas, Dubara. I don't think I know the rest. Let's, let's do, say it together. I'll say it responsively. Indriyani Paranyahur. Indriyani Paranyahur. Indriyabhya Paramana. Indriyabhya Paramana. Manasas to Parabudhir. Manasas to Parabudhir. Yo Budhe Paratas to Saha. This, this, the working senses are superior to dull matter. The mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind. And he, the soul, is even higher than the intelligence purport. The senses are different outlets for the activities of lust. Lust is reserved within the body, but it gives vent through the senses. Therefore, the senses are superior to the body as a whole, these outlets are not in use when there is superior consciousness or Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, the soul makes direct connection with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the hierarchy of bodily functions as described here ultimately ends in the Supreme Soul. Bodily action means the functions of the senses and stopping the senses means stopping all bodily functions, bodily actions. But since the mind is active, then even though the body may be silent and at rest, the mind will act as it does during dreaming. But above the mind is the determination of the intelligence and above the intelligence, da, 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 the soul proper. If, therefore, the soul is directly engaged with the Supreme, naturally all other subordinates, namely the intelligence, mind, and senses, will be automatically engaged. In the Kata Upanishad, there is a similar passage in which it is said that the objects of sense gratification are superior to the senses. The mind is superior to the sense objects. If, therefore, the mind is directly engaged in the service of the Lord constantly, then there is no chance that the senses will become engaged in other ways. This mental attitude has already been explained. Param, drishtva, navartate. If the mind is engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord, there is no chance of its being engaged in the lower propensities. And the Kata Upanishad. The soul has been described as Mahan, the great. Therefore, the soul is above all, namely, the sense objects, the senses, the mind, and the intelligence. Therefore, directly understanding the constitutional position of the soul is the solution to the whole problem. Paragraph. With intelligence, one has to seek out the constitutional position of the soul and then engage the mind, always in Krishna consciousness. That solves the whole problem. A neophyte spiritualist is generally advised to keep aloof from the objects of the senses, but aside from that, one has to strengthen the mind by use of intelligence. If by intelligence one engages one's mind in Krishna consciousness by complete surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then automatically the mind becomes stronger. And even though the senses are very strong, like serpents, they will, they will be no more effective than serpents with broken fangs. But even though the soul is the master of intelligence and mind and the senses also still, unless 
it is strengthened by association with Krishna in Krishna consciousness, then there's every chance of falling down due to the agitated mind. And then comes the last verse of the chapter, the end of Karma Yoga chapter. Thus, knowing oneself to be transcendental to the material senses, mind and intelligence, O mighty armed Arjuna, one should study the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence, Krishna consciousness, and thus, by spiritual strength, conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. So it go, go, goes back to the question. It, it, the, the, whole th- the whole discussion is duty. And that's the frame of the, of the conversation. And duty is we have our own nature and you act according to your nature and offer the results to Krishna. Well, what about, you know, if we're impelled to do something, even as if it's against our will? Why does that happen? Lust, and you have to conquer lust. Lust is the enemy. It forces you to do things even you know better. Or you don't want to do them, and you do it anyways. And, you know, there's different degrees of that. Certainly there's more gross, um, dirty, contaminated kinds of things, but there's there's little things that all of us, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a description of unsteady bhakti. Here's something that I should do. I know that I should do. I think about it, consider it from different angles, and commit I'm going to do, but we don't do, or something I shouldn't do. And we consider it from different angles, and yeah, I shouldn't do, and we do. So we're, it's, that's unsteady bhakti. So bhakti has the power to overcome that unsteadiness, but it takes some, because we're weak. It's explained here, we're, because the, we're spiritually weak, it takes some time. And so regulation is necessary. Regulation is necessary. Regulation is necessary to give uh, strength, ultimately strength to the soul, you know, the, the, the awakened state of the soul being conscious of the Supreme and its position, strength to the intelligence, strength to the mind, strength to the senses to withdraw instead of go ahead and do it anyways. So strength is required. Regulation is is part of it. Knowledge is another part of it. Bhakti is ultimately it. Those are, uh, those are other items assist in the bhakti principle. Without the bhakti principle, it's, uh, it's not going to sustain. It goes up and then goes down. It goes up, that's unsteady. We're still under the influence of these lower modes because there's a nice Bhagavatam verse, uh, Canto 6, Chapter 2, Shukadeva Goswami is describing the, the various processes that lead to elevation can reduce the influence of ignorance and passion, but because rooted in the mind is the influence of ignorance and passion. Again, one goes down. We all, you know. Up, up, da, 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 Or the, you know, the, the, the highs and the lows of our <coughs> unsteady bhakti, the hills and the valleys of devotional service. So, that unsteadiness needs its cure, its regulation. And the, the, the items are, are mentioned here. Careful study of the scripture and hearing again and again and hearing again and again and applying, acting according to the, that knowledge. It's trying to act according to that knowledge, cultivating action according to that knowledge, guided by that knowledge. It leads to further purification. Ultimately, it's the bhakti principle. That's the, that's the driving force. One should steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence, Krishna consciousness, and thus, by spiritual strength, conquer the insatiable enemy known as lust. 
Now comes the chapter summary. This third chapter of Bhagavad Gita is conclusively directive to Krishna consciousness by knowing oneself as the eternal servant, servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead without considering impersonal voidness, the ultimate end. In the material existence of life, one is certainly influenced by propensities for lust and desire for dominating the resources of material nature, desire for overlording and for sense gratification is the greatest enemy of the conditioned soul, semicolon. But by the strength of Krishna consciousness, one can control the material senses, the mind and the intelligence. One may not give up work and prescribe duties all of a sudden, but by gradually developing Krishna consciousness, one can be situated in a transcendental position without being influenced by the material senses and the mind by steady intelligence directed towards one's pure identity. This is the sum total of this chapter. In the immature stage of material existence, philosophical speculations and artificial attempts to control the senses by the so-called practice of yogic postures can never help a man towards spiritual life. He must be trained in Krishna consciousness by higher intelligence. Chapter 12 gives those, you know, if you can't do this, do that. If you can't do that, do the other thing. If you can't do the other thing. There's uh, measures. Krishna is very kind. And if one's condition is really, really weak, and one's faith is really weak, and one's determination is very weak, then there's still something that can gradually, gradually. Ultimately, you know, faith is necessary. Some faith and some higher although I may not be clear what that higher is, some higher consciousness, and good association. So devotees are meant to be that good association and encourage people, uh, according to their position, to take a step towards Krishna. Certainly Bhagavad Gita is, is providing that knowledge. Um, I've just, a little sharing, I've just spent maybe three weeks visiting something like 17, 18 different universities all across the country. Well, the eastern half of the country. And um, lots of young people, they, they want to know. They know that they don't know, and they want to know. That's great. Most people don't know that they don't know. And most people don't want to know. But there are some people out there that they know they don't know and they want to know. And part of the problem is they're bombarded with misinformation. And they're trying to sort their way through that, you know, this misinformation and that misinformation and another information and piece it all together and it's, uh, it's a little confusing. So we have a, an, a, a great opportunity and that is to give the right information. And one of the best parts of giving the right information is you model it you'd be a good example of what the information is so they can see in you, this is what it looks like. And then th with that purity, then there's some force or some potency, spiritual strength as described here. That's our, that's our, our pro we, we, we get benefit we get some Chaitanya Mahaprabhu points <laughs> by acting as his representative and encouraging people to take the holy name, take the bhakti process, apply it in their life without forcing or pressure or condescending, just encouraging, apply these principles and see how they benefit. Now, back to us, we need to apply these principles 
because it's not just a matter of accepting the uh, the notion, but then applying the, the principles in our lives. And the more we do, the more there's purity, and the more there's purity, the more there's the capacity to be a good instrument in our lives of going back to Godhead and indicating to others, at least, you know, over there, there's the path. The Vartma Pradarshaka Guru position, showing people the path. Any discussion? <coughs> the mind, intelligence are the sitting places of the lust uh, and, um, and senses. Senses. Thank you. And Maharaj, uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, recently I was reading um, Canto 2, last chapter. Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. Mm. In that, uh, in Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada, it is saying that one should use the intelligence uh, to determine the, what is good, what is bad. Like a, it was explaining that mind is a reflection of the uh, determining the, um, like what is good for me, what is good bad for me. But one should use the intelligence to become Krishna consciousness and all. So by Sri in Bhagavad Gita we read that lust is also one of the sitting place of the intelligence. So by being said that the how we can use intelligence. I think I understand your question. On the one hand, but on the other hand. If the intelligence is one of the sitting places of lust, how are we supposed to use it? Yes, Lord. It's going to be misleading. Well, the, the better intelligence than the intelligent is you take the intelligence of one who is of Krishna or Krishna's representatives and we're guided in that way. So we can check our intelligence against that intelligence. That's like, the, that's the standard. We're guided by that intelligence of, of liberated souls, or Krishna himself, from Bhagavad Gita. And let that become the intelligence that guides us. Or say it the other way. We, you know, something within you, knowing that your intelligence is uh, uh, one of the sitting places of lust, when your intelligence directs, I should, you know, do this or do that, or don't do this or don't do that, or do it this way, that way, you know, you you hold up to the light of what are the what are the teachings of the Bhaktivedanta purports, etc. Do they match? Then you go forward. If they don't match, then you don't go forward. Make it give some practical example. I'm thinking of some practical examples, but it's not so difficult. Anything else? Yes? <coughs> Maybe I misunderstood or not clear. Uh, but the removes anartha and uh, anartha blocks bhakti or uh, not okay bhakti anarthas have the power to block therefore they're more diff it's more difficult to remove them ultimately they can be removed 
but it's more difficult to remove them. Like, the, the, just using that metaphor, clouds in the sky are the result of the heat and the light of the sun evaporates water and makes clouds in the sky. So now the clouds in the sky that's the product of the heat and light of the sun blocks the light, heat and light of the sun. But, but the, when the, the clouds release the rain, then the clouds are no longer blocking the heat and the light of the sun. So that's just the metaphor. Now, anarthas arise from different sources. Anarthas arise from offenses. And when one makes offense, anartha results, and anartha blocks the power of bhakti. So one has to no longer continue to make offense, which just take the you know, offenseless chanting of the holy name. But because of offenses, although the holy name, nam nam akari bahu danija sarva shaktis, we don't get the full effect of the name because of the anarthas in the heart. So it doesn't mean you're forever stuck, but you strive to come to the stage of offenseless chanting. You can do that through the power of bhakti. But meanwhile, in the intermediate period of time, anarthas have the power to block the power of bhakti. It's slower. Sin can be removed quickly by the power of bhakti. Karma can be removed quickly. doesn't mean altogether the tendency to do the same thing again is removed, but the bhakti has the power to do that too. Even abhas bhakti has the power to do that. But anarchas are more pernicious, they're more difficult to, re to remove for the reason mentioned. Sin doesn't have that power. Anartas have that power. Where do they get the power? From Krishna. <laughs> you make offense and it's not the same as committing sin. It's not that sin is okay, but making offense is more, more dangerous than sin. So we engage in the bhakti process it's ultimately the bhakti process that can remove the anartha. Not us, not our own effort. But it's a combination. Our effort that is desisting from the offenses and gradually the power of bhakti. The, the, the example is given uh, by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur as a man who has fever. And when the man has, when a man has, when somebody has fever, they have no appetite. If they tried to eat something, they couldn't. They couldn't digest it, it would make them more ill. So they don't eat. But it's, it's nourishment that's going to give strength again, but they can't. But they have to have the right medicine. And over a period of time with the right medicine, the fever can subside and then gradually appetite resumes. And then gradually there's strength again. So our medicine is Bhagavad Dharma, even were Janata Agha, with abundance of anartas. We're, we're encouraged to engage in hearing and chanting the topics of the Supreme Lord, even I may not have great attraction for them. It's the medicine. Bhavoshadach, Shrota. Mano biramat. Okay. okay, what's next? Nidam Rita. Mars, we have computer and we have the book. Show it you. Book is good. So we start. Okay. Start there. Okay.
Who is speaking? Nandarani. I finished cooking that afternoon around four o'clock. And then I went home to get dressed for the wedding. Although I had never worn anything but old dresses and jeans, Swamiji has suggested to the other ladies that they find a way to put me in, into a sari for the wedding. So we bought a piece of silk to use for a sari. I went to Malati's house. She was going to try to help me put it on. I couldn't keep it on. And she had to sew it on me. <laughs> then they decorated me with flowers and took me to Swamiji and showed him. He was very happy. He said, this is the way our women should always look. No more jeans <laughs> and dresses. They should always wear saris. Actually, I looked a fright. I kept stumbling and they had to sew the cloth on me. The Swamiji thought it was wonderful. The cloth was all one color. So Swamiji said, next time you should buy cloth that has a little border on the bottom. So it's two colors. I like two colors better. We went downstairs to the wedding. Swamiji met my relatives. He spoke to them very politely. My mother cried a lot during the ceremony. I was very satisfied that she had been blessed by meeting Swamiji. Next, big gap. Steve Bollert, age 20, born and raised in New York and now living the hippie life in San Francisco, had read in the oracle about Swami Bhaktivedanta's coming to San Francisco. The idea of meeting an Indian Swami has interested him and responding to a notice he had seen posted on Haight Street, he had, that's H-A-I-G-H-T, Haight Street, had gone along with Carolyn Gold, the woman he was living with, to the airport to meet Swami Bhaktivedanta. He and Carolyn had both gotten a blissful lift by chanting Hare Krishna and seeing Prabhupada, and they began regularly attending the lectures and kirtans at the temple. Steve decided that he wanted to become like the Swami. So he and Carolyn went together to see Prabhupada and request initiation. Speaking privately with Prabhupada in his room, they discussed obedience to the spiritual master and becoming vegetarian. When Prabhupada told them they should either stop living together or get married, they said they would like to get married. An initiation date was set. <laughs> It was the beginning of the Hare Krishna movement. Prabhupada asked Steve to shave his long hair and beard. Why do you want me to shave my head? Steve protested. <laughs> Krishna had long hair. Rama had long hair. Lord Chaitanya had long hair. And Christ had long hair. Why should I shave my head? <laughs> Prabhupada smiled and replied, Because now you are following me. There was a print on the wall of Suradas, a Vaishnava. You should shave your head like that, Prabhupada said, pointing to Suradas. I don't think I'm ready for that yet, Steve said. All right. You are still a young man. There is still time. But at least you should shave your face clean and cut your hair like a man. On the morning of initiation, Steve shaved off his beard and cut his hair around his ears so that it was short in front, but long in the back. <laughs> How's this, he asked. You should cut the back also, Prabhupada replied. <laughs> Steve agreed. To Steve, Prabhupada gave the name Subal, and to Carolyn the name Krishna Devi, Krishna Devi. A few days later, he performed their wedding. Since each ceremony was another occasion for kirtan and prasadam distribution, onlookers became attracted, and the spiritual names and married couples increased. With each ceremony, Prabhupada's spiritual family grew. The harmonious atmosphere was like that of a small loving family, and Prabhupada dealt with his disciples intimately without the formalities of an institution or hierarchy. Disciples would approach him for various reasons, entering the little apartment to be alone with him, 
as he sat on a mat before his makeshift desk in the morning sunlight. With men like Mukunda, Guruta, Shamsundar, Swamiji was a friend. With Janaki and Govinda Dasi, he was sometimes ready to be chided, almost like their naughty son, or he would be their grandfatherly teacher of cooking, the enforcer of the rules of kitchen cleanliness. And to all of them, he was the unfathomable, pure devotee of Lord Krishna, who knew the conclusions of all the Vedic scriptures and who knew beyond all doubts the truth of transmigration. He could answer all questions. He could lead them beyond material life, beyond hate, ashbury, hippiedom, and into the spiritual world with Krishna. Then a news section. It was 7 p.m. Srila Prabhupada entered the temple dressed in a saffron dhoti, an old turtleneck jersey under a cardigan sweater and a chadar around his shoulders. Walking to the dais in the rear of the room, he took his seat. The dais, a cushion atop a redwood plank two feet off the floor, was supported between two redwood columns. In front of the dais, stood a cloth-covered <coughs> lectern with a bucket of cut flowers on either side. Covering the wall behind the dais was a typical Indian madras with Haridasa's crude painting of Lord Chaitanya in Kirtan hanging against it. Srila Prabhupada picked up his cartels, wrapped the cloth straps around his fingers, forefingers, and looked out at his young followers sitting cross-legged on the burgundy rug. The men were bearded. Almost everyone wore long hair, beads, exotic clothing, and trinkets. The bulbs hanging from the ceiling diffused their light through Japanese paper lanterns and Navajo God's eye symbols dangling, dangled from strings. Prabhupada began the ringing one, two, three rhythm, and Shamsundar began pumping the harmonium. Although the harmonium was a simple instrument, a miniature piano keyboard to be played with the right hand and a bellows to be pumped with the left hand, no one in the Frederick Street storefront knew how to play it. So it became simply, quote, the drone. Another important kirtan instrument, the two-headed mridanga drum from India, was meant to, went for intricate rhythmic accompaniments, but even Mukunda could not play it, could play it only very simply, matching the one, two, three of Prabhupada's cartels. There were other instruments on hand, a kettle drum, the pride of the temple, high grievous old cornet, a few conch shells and a horn Hayagriva had made by shellacking a piece of kelp he had found on the beach. Some guests had brought their own flutes, pipes, and bongos. But for now, they let their instruments remain still and clapped to Prabhupada's rhythm as he sang the evening prayers. Prabhupada's Sanskrit hymn praised the Vaishnava spiritual masters. For each great devotee in the disciplic succession, he sang a specific prayer. First, he sang, he chanted the poetic description of the transcendental qualities of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, then Gorkishor Das Babaji, Bhakti Thakur, one after another. One prayer described Srila Bhakti Siddhanta as the deliverer of the fallen souls, and another praised Gorkishor as Renunciation personifies always merged in the feelings of separation and intense love for Krishna. Srila Prabhupada sang of Lord Chaitanya, the golden complexion, supreme personality of Godhead, who distributed pure love of Krishna. And he sang of Lord Krishna, the ocean of mercy, the friend of the distress, the source of creation. As Prabhupada became absorbed in the bhajan, his body trembled with ecstatic emotion. 
the group on the floor sat swaying from side to side, watching him, his eyes closed in meditation, his delicate practiced fingers expertly playing the cymbals. They heard the heartfelt minor moods and tones of his voice, unlike anything they had heard before. Then he began the familiar mantra they had come to hear. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Then immediately, whoops, they joined him. The horns and drums sounded and soon all the other instrument players joined in. Gradually, a few at a time, members of the audience rose to their feet and began to dance. Prabhupada's followers stood and began stepping from side to side as he had shown them, sometimes raising their hands in the air. Others moved as they pleased, occasionally opening his eyes and glancing around Prabhupada sat firmly, chanting, though his head and body were trembling. After 20 minutes, many of the young dancers were leaping, jumping, and perspiring as Prabhupada continued to sing leading the dancers by the beat of his kartals. His eyes were closed, yet he controlled the entire wild congregation, playing his kartals loudly. The chanting and dancing continued and Prabhupada approved. The kirtan of these hippies was different from the chanting of Indian brahmanas, but Prabhupada didn't mind. His standard was devotion. In his Radha Krishna temple, whatever he accepted, Krishna accepted. This was his offering to Krishna. Through his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Prabhupada was absolutely confident. Even if his younger, young devotees didn't know how to play the harmonium keyboard or the radanga, even if they didn't know the congregational kirtan should be done not in constant unison as they were doing, but responsibly, and even if they didn't know how to honor the Guru, still, because they were chanting and dancing, he encouraged them and nodded to them. Yes. Wild elements were there, of course. People whose minds and intentions were far away in some chemically induced fantasy. Yet the mood was dominated by Srila Prabhupada's followers, who danced with their arms upraised and watched their leader carefully. Although in many ways they were still like hippies, they were Swamiji's disciples and they wanted to please him and follow his instructions. They wanted to attain Krishna consciousness for all the varied punctuation of horns and timpani. The kirtan remained sweet. Hayagriva even played his cornet in tune and only during every other mantra Last paragraph. Srila Prabhupada knew that some aspects of the kirtan were wrong or below standard, but he accepted the offering, and not awkwardly, but lovingly. He simply wanted these American boys and girls to chant that they dressed irregularly, jumped too savagely, or had the wrong philosophy, did not over-concern him. These boys and girls were chanting Hare Krishna. So at least... For the present, they were pure. The hippies knew that, too, and they loved it. Srila Prabhupada Ki.